Hello everyone and welcome back to Towergate. This is Towergate day number 933. October the 21st, 2019, Monday. Oh, it's a rainy Monday here. Have a big day. Alrighty, so now I got my timer set. <laughs> Gotta have the timer set. Uh, okay, yes, uh, it is Monday. It's a rainy Monday here, so uh, hopefully you're having beautiful weather there. We have beautiful weather here over the weekend. Saturday and Sunday were just perfect, like 75 degrees and sunny and uh, you know not too hot, not too cold, nice breeze blowing, cool at night. Uh, just uh, really good weather we've had in the last couple days, but I think tomorrow we're going to, or I should say, well, yeah, tomorrow will be Monday for, for all of us to be getting some rain. But uh, anyway, we had a great weekend. I hope you all did too. Okay, so let's go ahead and get to the news of the day, and then we'll get to the dumbass of the week. Um, so NBC, the uh, network so-called news channel, NBC, is reporting that, quote, the Justice Department officials have said that John Durham has found something significant and that critics should be careful. This is an NBC uh, reporter saying that speaking with people at the Justice Department, they're telling him that John Durham has found something significant and that critics should be careful. So <clears throat> he doesn't give the context to, 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 the, to the background of that statement, but clearly what he's indicating is that there are media reports out there that are either ignoring the Bar Durham investigation, or they're downplaying it. And yes, we have seen the New York Times. Uh, we have seen a couple other uh, news sites trying to downplay the Barr investigation or continue to call it a conspiracy theory or what have you. And so this is an NBC reporter, uh, and they are fake news. Um, but every now and then they may report a little truth, and that appears to be what's going on with this NBC reporter. Because he is saying that Justice Department officials he's speaking with are basically sending out a warning saying, hey, these people who are, uh, you know, being critical of John Durham, his investigation, the fact that it's all conspiracy theory and there's nothing to it, they should be very careful because um, these Justice Department officials are telling this NBC reporter because Durham has found something significant. Now, I think he's probably found many, many, many things that are significant, but in the overall scheme of things, he's found something significant that would um, make the uh, accusation that it's all a conspiracy theory uh, to be factually incorrect because he is finding things and that he has found something significant. Now. Conservative Treehouse, Last Refuge, has got his thoughts on that, and I think you should maybe take the time to read that if you get a chance. Uh, I did, and he kind of ties it back to uh, the Senate Intel Committee and this indictment of James Wolfe and uh, their involvement. I'll get a little bit more into that here in a minute, but I, I, that's kind of the Conservative Treehouse, Last Refuge take on it. Definitely worth a read. Um, but... I think just in general terms, when you when the people at uh, Justice Department are telling this NBC reporter, I think essentially what they're trying to clue him on to, because obviously they can't get specific, I think what they're trying to tell him is that um, Durham has discovered that there is an attempted coup, was an attempted coup, still continues to this day, and that the pretext uh, that was used to initiate the impeachment was a manufactured hoax knowingly manufactured hoax because remember this is the this is what Durham understands he knows that some of the guilty parties particularly the CIA are going to just try to say they were duped or the FBI is going to say they were duped or the State Department is saying they were duped this is the excuse that they're going to go for they're all going to play dumb oh we were duped and then point the finger at each other and I think that this is what Durham is trying to lock down he's trying to take away that excuse because he knows that's exactly the excuse that's going to be used so he not only wants to find the coup and the coup plotters, he wants to make absolutely sure that he proves that it wasn't just a series of mishaps, a um, fog of war situation, or a situation where 
they trusted uh, Christopher Steele because of his credentials or, or, or what have you. I think that what Durham is trying to do is nail it down so that they don't have that exit door to run out of this, oh, we were duped or, or, or what have you. I think he's trying to make sure that he can uh, cross all his T's and dot all his I's and prove that it wasn't just, um, you know, that they were duped. In fact, that they knowingly manufactured false evidence. They knew it was false evidence and that uh, there was no accidents going on here. This was all 100% uh, premeditated. Uh, they knew exactly what they, they were doing. They knew what they were using. And the simple fact is they thought it would work. That They really did not think Trump would win. And that's that's the problem that they have. And in doing so, they did not cover their tracks. They've left so many breadcrumbs for someone like Durham uh, to follow that uh, while it will take a while to wrap your arms around all of this, eventually uh, he will. And uh, I think that that's I think that that's what my take is here. Is that um, two things? Number one, uh, to this uh, NBC reporter, uh, hey, guess what? These people that are saying this is all just a conspiracy theory and there's nothing here, they're going to be proven wrong. And number two, uh, the people who are behind it, who are going to use the excuse after the IG report comes out that they were duped is not going to fly because Durham is going to slam that door shut uh, before he ever brings the charge. And so I, I think that that's, that's what I, I take from it. We also learn uh, in the last uh, 24 hours or so, two or three different uh, sources reporting, uh, one being the conservative treehouse, Last Refuge, and I don't think that they were the original source. I think they're getting it from a real clear investigation story. Um, that was a story, it was a real clear investigations story, and the writer was from the New York Times. It's basically saying that, yes, Durham did interview Christopher Steele. He has interviewed Christopher Steele, so that means that both Horowitz and Durham have interviewed Christopher Steele. And it is suggested again by Conservative Treehouse that when um, Durham interviewed Christopher Steele, he probably asked him about Daniel Jones. And this gets into the story that Conservative Treehouse uh, ties to the first thing we were just talking about with this NBC reporter. So just a little background. I can't go as deep into it as I'd like to. You'll have to read it for yourself over on Conservative Treehouse. I just don't have time. But remember, um, the Senate Intelligence Committee, which we know is the most deep state uh, committee that there is uh, in the Congress, headed by uh, Richard Burr and um, now Mark Warner, but it was turn in your guns, Mr. and Mrs. America Feinstein at first, and then she s stepped aside and allowed Warner to take over the as the ranking member. Now keep in mind, when Feinstein walked away, uh, one of her top staffers, this guy Daniel Jones, left at that time as well. And then he started doing something else. Uh, he started working for George Soros and a group of very wealthy people who were pumping tons of money, as in like $50 million just for starters, and asked him to start working with Confusion GPS. And that's where the funding was picked up. So once the, once the funding stopped from the DNC and all that, Daniel Jones, uh, working kind of as an intermediary between Confusion GPS and these wealthy donors, one of them being George Soros. Um, he be, he kind of became the intermediary. And so the funding for Confusion GPS continued uh, after the election was over. And the funding was coming from these uh, wealthy anti-Trumpers, including Soros. And Daniel Jones was acting as an intermediary. And if you remember those emails between Warner um, and uh, this attorney, Mark Waldman, they were having these discussions, they were trying to get, um, um, they were trying to get Oleg Deripaska into the United States so that he could testify, but they, they, they needed to be able to cut a deal, and that required Warner working with Comey to get Comey to uh, release whatever it was that was holding Deripaska from being able to enter the country, so they were trying to work out that deal and some sort of a quid pro quo. Uh, Steele was involved. Uh, because Deripaska was working for Steele's attorney at the same time. So you had this kind of cabal going on. And Daniel Richmond, I, I mean, um, uh, Dan Jones, was sort of acting as an intermediary. His name comes up in those conversations between Warner and Waldman uh, as they're discussing all this stuff. 
And there's even a conversation where they talk about the fact that Daniel Jones is going to go talk to Christopher Steele personally, and he's going to try to work some things out. The specifics of that, we're not really sure. And this also ties in to the James Wolf leak. Remember him, that James Wolf who leaked uh, that classified information to this, this girl, a uh, reporter, who he was apparently fond of or maybe having a relationship with. Uh, and, of course, he ended up leaking all that classified information, but he ended up um, not really being charged with that. All he got charged with, even though he lied to the FBI three times, he was only charged for one count of lying to the FBI and got a very minor slap on the wrist when, in fact, uh, he should have been uh, given a much more serious uh, charge, uh, but, but he was let off the hook because he could have implicated about 15 members of um, Congress, including Warner, and, uh, uh, and Burr and a few others, and we know that because his attorney sent a letter to 15 members of Congress, and I think they were all senators. There might have been some House members there, but I think they were mostly senators, and it was this letter saying, hey, you know, if Mr. Wolf, my client, has to testify, I just want to let you know that your name's probably going to come up in this. And so that's why they were able to get the DOJ uh, to go easy. Rodenstein specifically made the call to go easy on Wolf because Wolf would have given up part of the plot that Rodenstein was also involved in. The Senate Intelligence Committee was uh, uh, in cahoots with the DOJ uh, in their efforts to initiate the coup plot. And uh, so this is what... Uh, uh, last Refuge over at Conservative Treehouse is 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 trying to is, is believing at this point that Durham has discovered this, so that's kind of how that ties in. And again, you can go over to Conservative Treehouse and read that for yourself. <clears throat> it gets a little more detail, I should say, that I don't have time to go into. But I think the uh, the thing that was probably the biggest reveal for me uh, that I read was in the Real Clear Investigation story. Uh, from the New York Times when they basically say that, yeah, Durham did interview Christopher Steele. And up to this point, I believe that he had not. Uh, because if you remember, Christopher Steele said first he wouldn't have talked to anybody. Then he agreed he would talk to the inspector general, but that he would not talk to Durham. But it appears that uh, uh, A.G. Barr was able to, I guess, convince some uh, government officials in the U.K. or convince Christopher Steele or someone that he should go ahead and talk to Mr. Durham. And I guess that they use a tactic I would use, which is, hey, you can you can, you can talk to us as a witness. We're not really going after you. We're, we're, we're interested in the people in the United States who are involved in all this. We're not really targeting you. But if you're not going to cooperate with us, then we'll just consider you a hostile non-witness, and maybe we will have to target you. So I think that's probably how they played it. And uh, Christopher Steele's attorneys may have asked for some assurance uh, that he would have some sort of... Um, some sort of immunity, maybe limited immunity, that he could disclose some things and not worry about incriminating himself. I think that's probably what his biggest concern was, and I think they probably did something to alleviate those concerns. Uh, otherwise, his attorneys probably never would have uh, allowed him to talk to Durham. That's just my thoughts. <clears throat> uh, we are hearing, again, uh, that the IG report could be released this week. We know there's a battle going on between uh, the DOJ, the FBI, and Horowitz. Um, the FBI clearly is a problem. Uh, there are certain things they do not want released. The CIA may have some issues as well. Um, Horowitz will get the report back, and then, um, you know, once he gets the report back, any of the things that they ask to be taken out, uh, he can look at that, but he can overrule them. I do believe the Horowitz can overrule them. He'll need the final approval of the Attorney General, but he probably would get it from Barr. So that appears to be what's going on, but there are people now saying at some point, probably maybe toward the end of the week, we could see the um, Horowitz, the Horowitz report being released. And uh, my God, I mean, it's time. Please, just release the damn thing and unredact it all. We're eventually going to figure it all out anyway. Yes, and we talked yesterday about uh, Clapper and Brennan uh, are a little nervous because they now learned that they are definitely going to be interviewed by um, Durham. And, uh, you know, watching Clapper and Brennan over the last couple of weeks, that, since they've obviously been uh, contacted or, or they just know, they can sniff it, they know that they're going to be interviewed, uh, you can already see them setting up their defense. Because what they're doing is they're now both going out there and saying, well, you know, uh, 
it's possible. It's possible that we could have been wrong. It's possible that we could have gotten uh, this information that looked like something really incriminating was going on when maybe something else was going on and we just weren't aware of it. So it's very possible. In other words, they're, they're setting up the, oh, we got duped strategy. They're also, in addition to that, they're saying, hey, you have to keep in mind, you know, hey, we're just intelligence agencies. Uh, we don't, you know, we gather bits and pieces of information. We put it all together. We come up with uh, what we think is a recommendation for what we think may be going on, and we pass it along to law enforcement, specifically the FBI, and it's up to them to determine whether or not to launch investigations, get FISA warrants, uh, charge people with crimes, and all this sort of thing. Hey, we in the intelligence community, we just pick up bits and pieces of information and we forward that on. We have no actionable authority to launch investigations, to uh, indict people, to get FISAs, and all this sort of thing. Um, so this is what, um, uh, well, they can get FISAs, but not on American citizens. So. Uh, this is the this is sort of what you can see Clapper and uh, Brennan, Mr. Potato Head. Uh, this is you can see for the past two or three weeks they are laying out what their defensive position is going to be and how they're going to play it when they're interviewed by Barr. They're going to constantly have their ask every every question they're asked. They're going to respond by saying, "Well, you know, we're really not sure. Uh, you know, we 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 heard we were getting this information through." five eyes, or we were getting this information from so-and-so and so-and-so. And, -so. and I guess they think this is going to work for them, but it's really not going to work for them um, because we already know from Devin Nunes that this information did not come through official channels. It came through some private intelligence firm. And I think we're going to find out that that was Hackloot. Hackloot. Why Hackloot? Well, because, um, uh, because Hackloot uh, is connected to British intelligence. They are basically what Hacklook does is they are in the UK, in London. They're a bunch of ex-spies from the UK and other places. Whenever there is sensitive type things that could be a bit shady, the official intelligence agencies over in the UK don't want to touch because it's a political problem. They pass it off to a private intelligence agency like Hacklook. And we know that uh, Downer, Halper and Mifsud all have connections to Hackloot. In fact, Downer served on the board. But more importantly, we recently learned that Hackloot does not just have an office in London. They have offices around the world, including one in New York. And a photo recently emerged showing John Brennan, Mr. Potato Head, standing front and center at, at their offices at the New York Hackloot surrounded by a bunch of the people on the staff there at Hackloot in New York. So here we now have a direct tie to John Brennan with Hackloot. We already had the direct tie with Downer and Halper and Mifsud to Hackloot. So all these people are connected to Hackloot. And then, of course, we get the story yesterday. We find out that the SIM cards and the uh, Blackberries, the phones that were used by Mifsud, uh, were from the UK. Those are UK issued SIM cards and there's an identification number on the SIM card which tells them that. So these phones were passed over to Mifsud from someone in the UK. Uh, now maybe that was done on Brennan's direction, maybe it was done on Peter Ben Strokinus's, uh instructions or Prestep or someone like that, but it appears that they used Hackloot to run the dirty game so that the official intelligence agencies in the UK would not have their fingerprints on it. So this appears to be what was going on. Now we do know, however, that Christopher Steele was briefing uh, actual official intelligence people uh, in the UK government during the summer of 2016. Uh, we also know that, um, that there were British government officials, including one very high level official who uh, did contact uh, uh, high-level U.S. government officials and tell them that it was the official position of some of the people in the higher-ups and the British intelligence that they were skeptical of Christopher Steele. Um, they were skeptical of his dossier claims and of his um, of his motives. 
uh, for being involved in, in all of this. And they were trying to distance himself from Christopher Steele more than just distance himself, actually uh, contact um, high-level officials in the United States to go on the record with an official letter from the official intelligence people in the UK saying, hey, just so you know, Christopher Steele, you know, don't don't mix us up with him. You know, we question a lot of the things that, that's come from Steele, his motives and everything else. So just so you know, that's the official position. We are skeptical of Steele. We're not we're not supporting or backing his accusations at all. And this information was given to uh, American authorities sometime right after um, the first of the year, January of 2017. Sometime in January 2017, this information was passed along to American officials. Durham likely has that letter. So that's probably something he also discussed with the officials while he was in UK. So anyway, uh, yeah, some very interesting things there uh, today. And um, I think right now there are a lot of people that are quite nervous. Uh, Durham is obviously really digging into this thing. And uh, I expect that... Um, I expect that uh, he is going to uncover the coup plot. As far as uh, prosecutions and things like that, again, as I've said many times before over the years that I've been doing this, I don't think that you can have these types of crimes committed at this high of a level and have people just walk away scot-free. I believe there will have to be indictments, um, and I think Barr understands this as well. Otherwise, you have a completely corrupted law enforcement intelligence agencies who, if they face no repercussions for the crimes they committed will have no reason to act differently in the future and I think it's too big of a risk to take and so while it's a big risk uh, to, to to take down high-level government officials uh, you know it's it, there's always kind of some fallout from that some recoil from that but by not doing it may be even worse in fact it would be even worse I think that's what Barr is going to conclude and I think that that's the road we're headed down I do expect that the kickoff and the launch of all of this is going to be uh, right after the Horowitz report comes out. I think the Horowitz report comes out and that is going to justify everything that Barr and Durham have been doing and will continue to do. I think once that comes out, I would say a week or two after that, Barr is going to come out, have a press conference, and tell everyone that Durham is doing an actual criminal investigation and uh, they're hot on the trail of the perps. I think that's what we're going to learn. I think it's what's going to happen. Of course, there's a big election tomorrow in Canada, or that would be today. You're watching the video today, Monday. Um, right now, as I'm sitting here, I just checked uh, some of the uh, poll indicators. Now it looks like uh, the Conservative Party may have a slight edge right now. Uh, they're not voting yet, but in polling, they have a slight edge. And of course, by Monday evening, uh, we should know whether or not that idiot Justin Trudeau is going to be taken out or if he's going to be reelected. Uh, and, of course, uh, things are crazy and going on with Brexit. I know a lot of you people follow Brexit. It appears at this point that um, this thing is probably going to end up in the courts. Uh, I don't know if uh, Boris Johnson will go ahead with a uh, hard Brexit on the 31st. That's starting to look unlikely. This thing's probably going to end up in the courts. But I think, ultimately, nothing is really going to, to change very much over there until they have a general election. Unfortunately, you can't get a general election because you need a two-thirds vote in the parliament, and they don't have the two-thirds vote. So it looks like uh, they're in a very interesting situation right now with Brexit in the UK. Uh, very interesting to, to watch, and uh, we'll continue to follow that in the days to come. Things are uh, really uh, getting crazy. Okay. <clears throat> Dumbass of the week. I have to say... Before I even get started, um, I voted this week for the Rotten Reverend Clinton because not so much for the Rot Re Rotten Reverend Clinton. It was a stupid, dumb thing that she did. Very dumb thing that she did, by the way. Um, but obviously, uh, Tulsi Gabbard, if, I could, if this week could have been Hero of the Week, it would have been Tulsi Gabbard. But we don't do Hero of the Week. We do Dumbass of the Week. So it was the Rotten Reverend's dumb, idiotic, stupid move making those uh, statements about Tulsi and, to some extent, Jill Stein which set up Tulsi, really. So the Rotten Reverend Clinton, and I have to say, I've been doing Dumbass of the Week now for quite some time. I've never, ever seen anyone ever get this many first place votes for Dumbass of the Week. Uh, the winner this week got 31 first place votes. That's never happened before. I don't think I've ever had anyone get more than 20 or 
you know, 21, 22 first place votes for Dumbass of the Week. So this week's winner blew away the field. It wasn't even close. JC, JC Hasty, he's going to go with Pelosi and uh, whoever forged the Cummings signature, <laughs> Elijah Cummings signature on those subpoenas. <laughs> Very well done. Sane Environmentalist, he's going to go with the Rotten Reverend Clinton, CNN, uh, for being so evil. Yes, they are. Walker on the Hill, the Rotten Reverend Clinton. Patty, Patty Willing, <laughs> she always gets it right. The Rotten Reverend Clinton. T.W. Wintex, the Wicked Witch of D.C., the Rotten Reverend. Susong, the Rotten Reverend. Jake, uh, Jane Fonda, yes, that's right, Hanoi Jane. And LeBron James, who got quite a few votes this week. Stage Door Johnny, the Rotten Reverend Clinton. Leslie, the Rotten Reverend Clinton. Sherman Lynn, the Rotten Reverend Clinton. Cards, he's going to go with ABC's fake video, uh, which I'm sure many of you saw. Uh trying to pretend it was a video from Syria when it was actually from Kentucky. <laughs> they got quite a few votes this week, too, uh, because of that video. Um, so the Cards uh, was the first one to do that, and uh, he was followed by several more people with ABC's fake video. Alan Williams, the Rotten Reverend Clinton. Peter Swales, the Rotten Reverend Clinton. The Rotten Reverend Clinton's parachute. <laughs> and Elijah Cummings, her parachute, which didn't open, <laughs> by the way. Keith Fellows, the Rotten Reverend Clinton. Oregon, Oregon, the Rotten Reverend Clinton. Douglas, Douglas is going to go. His first pick, LeBron. Yeah, we know he's an NBA fan. He's probably watching that story very closely. Drudge, that's a very good, uh, yeah, Drudge had a couple votes in last week. Uh, but Drudge lost a lot. And I think he's probably commenting here, the comment from Douglas, how he thinks about the, the fact that last week we, we focused on Drudge's anti-Trump uh, pro-impeachment uh, take. But I think he may be commenting on the fact that we just learned how many page views Drudge has lost in the last week. And it's unbelievable. I forget what the number was, but it's, a, it's a tens of millions. Uh, his third pick for Douglas is Yovanovitch, the ambassador who tried to punk Trump, who may be having some issues herself for spying on, illegally spying on journalists. <clears throat> Jenny Tweets is going to go with the Rotten Reverend, CNN, and Madame Botox. Susan Lowell is going to go with the Rotten Reverend Clinton and Zucker. Zucker also got quite a few votes this week. Uh, Peter James, our good friend in the Great Northwest. He's going to go with Piglosi, the Rotten Reverend, and Shiffity. <laughs> Shiffity, <laughs> the bug-eyed fool. William Biliani is going to go with the Rotten Reverend Clinton. Jeanette, is, Jeanette Bateman is going to go with the Rotten Reverend Clinton, the ABC video, and Zucker. There's three solid picks. Friend in Liberty, the Rotten Reverend Clinton. Mystic Meadows Homestead is going to go with LeBron. LeBron James. Yeah, think about LeBron James as someone mentioned in the comment section. Very, very good comment. Uh, LeBron James uh, is opposed to slavery unless it's the slaves in China making those shoes, uh, his shoes, which he reels in about $30 million a year from. Then he really supports slavery if it's making him $30 million a year. Uh, we have Iowa Russian Stormy Bot. Adam Ship. Gordon. Gordon's going to go with the Rotten Reverend Clinton. MCM McDo, the Rotten Reverend Clinton. Larry Lyons. Larry's going to go with Joe Biden. Yes. Um, Yovanovich and Chalupa. That's right. Chalupa, definitely someone that I'm sure that Durham either is going to interview or has interviewed, and she's got a lot of problems. Uh, she was a paid... Uh, consultant from the D DNC, which means she could have uh, criminal liability. And by the way, uh, if you guys get some time, go over to Larry Lyons' channel and check out his YouTube channel. Some great acoustic guitar playing and singing. He does some really cool versions, uh, arrangements of popular songs, including, I think, some originals as well. So definitely check out Larry's YouTube channel. He does great, great work. Uh, big fan. Internet Privacy Advocate's going to go with the Rotten Reverend Clinton. Rose. Love Rose. And she's got that in her, in her little icon. It's a rose. <laughs> Lovely. She's going to go with the Rotten Reverend. Larry Rydell. He's going to go with the Rotten Reverend over LeBron. He was kind of leaning LeBron. Then he went with Rotten Reverend Clinton. Jonathan Cassidy is going to go with the Rotten Reverend. And also uh, the press uh, who went after Mulvaney. 
uh, and of course uh, the nothing is happening crowd being his third pick. In other words, people who don't think there's anything really going on uh, with this Durham Bar investigation. They are about to be uh, getting a serious awakening call here very soon. Ed Lauder, he's going to go with Mulvaney. We have Linda Thomas going with uh, Madame Botox, Piglosi, Dennis Waddell. He's going to go with the skateboarder, Bobby O. Yeah, the skate is so bad for the skateboarder, Bobby O, that I think he's now maybe considering a career after his political career ends very shortly here. Uh, he may be trying to be a salesman for uh, women's feminine hygiene products, which he'll also try to sell uh, as uh, being, uh, can be used by men as well. That's, that's kind of where he seems to be going. And that's why Dennis Waddell probably selected him as the first choice for Dumbass of the Week. Jamie is going to go with the Rotten Irvin Clinton. We have Lee. Lee wants to nominate himself for not watching the Kip Simpson channel. Do you guys watch the Kip Sim Simpson channel? I'm going to have to look at that. I've never heard of Kip Simpson, but since you brought it up, Lee, I think I'll take a look. Uh, Daniel is going to go with the Rotten Irvin Clinton. Mrs. Miggins. Mrs. Miggins is going to go with Castro. And O'Rourke, Beto, uh, for what I just mentioned uh, just a second ago, uh, they, them getting involved in this National Period Day. Yeah, this national menstruation uh, thing that they're into. Uh, I don't know why we need a National Menstruation, menstruation Day uh, to make people aware that women have menstrual cycles. But I think what's actually more strange about it, I think they're actually trying to suggest that men could have menstruation cycles. How? I, I, that's one of them stories I don't even want to dig into. It's so freaking stupid that I don't even want to dig into it. But obviously Mrs. Miggins is familiar with this. And she's probably having a good laugh uh, that, that, uh, that, that you could enter into a presidential contest and expect to be taken seriously uh, by going out and promoting this uh, idea of National Period Day, or na I forget what they call it. Maybe it is National Period Day, but I, I thought it had something to do with like menstruation or whatever. But it's just we're getting really, really crazy and sick at this point now, folks. Uh, this some of this stuff is just you know, you know. I remember, you know, it wasn't that long ago. I guess maybe back in the seventies, if I remember correctly, they wouldn't even air commercials uh, on TV with women's feminine hygiene products. Uh, like this, I mean Kleenex, yeah, but uh, not like Kotex and things like that. No, they wouldn't even have them commercials on. I can't remember when they started putting them on, but I know back in the seventies, you know, they really didn't put those kinds of commercials on. But um, and it, obviously prior to that, and now they're trying to uh, pretend that men may have a need for these products. It's just absolutely insanity, absolute insanity. So very well done, Mrs. Miggins, for making sure that that point got brought up. Otherwise, I probably never would have mentioned it. <laughs> Joe Mack is going to go with Oprah uh, for this story about Trump making fat women, uh, black women, fat. Now, I didn't know that was Oprah that was behind that. I thought it was some local politician, female black politician that, that was making this argument. Um, but yeah, the idea that Trump is responsible for black women being fat. First of all, not all black women are fat. Uh, and how Trump would have anything to do with that is just beyond me. But again, it's this is like level six uh, Trump derangement syndrome to, to even entertain such a thought. Lori Holt is going to go with the Rotten Reverend Clinton, uh, Zucker, and ABC. Yes, Coyote. Coyote is going to go with Douglas <laughs> for Douglas's comment on my Dick Cheney shirt that I was wearing yesterday that says Duck It's Dick. And it shows Duck with a Dick Cheney with an M60 shooting God knows who. Uh, his friends most likely on a duck hunting trip. Uh, he also, um, Douglas for suggesting I need a whiteboard. <laughs> uh, I have whiteboards right here, a whole stack of them. Um, then we have Media Speaks. Going to go with the Rotten Reverend Clinton and Comey and Madame Botox. Gene. Gene is also uh, pointing out ABC News for that video. Madame Botox and the Bug-Eyed Fool. Jack Kennedy going with the Rotten Reverend Clinton. Youngblood uh, is going to go with anyone who believes Tulsi is not on the same team as Hillary. Both are support Antifa. Both are gun grabbers. Both are for open borders. And uh, yeah, there's certainly an argument to be made there. Um, 
in Fern. Fern is going to go with the French reporter who asked Donald Trump. I don't know how many of you saw this. Uh, just a brief little clip, but a French reporter is asking Donald Trump, you know, something about, you know, why the U.S. has such a good economy or something like that. And he says basically something to the effect of, well, it's probably because uh, we have a better president than you do. <laughs> I mean, it was just classic Trump. I mean, absolute classic Trump. Well, it should be no secret to anyone that uh, the Rotten Reverend Clinton totally blew away the field this week for first place votes for Dumbass of the Week. She wins with 31 votes. Coming in second place, we have Madame Botox with six votes. That's how big the spread was. Uh, ABC uh, comes in third place. They had four, uh, five votes, so they come in right behind that. But you know, if we actually did a fourth place uh, with people getting three votes, we would have had LeBron, Zucker, and Schiff all tying there. 